Hello and welcome to NRV Live at Lunch. We are so thrilled today to welcome a guest who has been in the room at the table at a historic time for peace and religious liberty in Israel and the Arab Muslim world. We're going to discuss his latest book, talk about the situation in the Middle East, and answer some questions of special interest to Christian communicators. So with that, let me introduce to you our special guest for today, commentator, strategist, and New York Times bestselling author, Joel C. Rosenberg. Joel, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, I'm honored and shalom uh, from Jerusalem. Joel Rosenberg has written 16 novels and five nonfiction books. He's also the founder and editor-in-chief of two news and analysis websites, allisrael.com and allarab.news. He's released two books this year, his latest political thriller, The Beirut Protocol, as well as the book we're discussing today, Enemies and Allies, examining the future of the Middle East 20 years after the terror attacks of September 11th, 2001. Counts numerous heads of state and their close advisors among the readers of his books. Joel has addressed audiences at the White House, Pentagon, U.S. Capitol, Canadian Parliament, European Union Parliament, the Israeli President's residence, and in March 2019, he met with President Trump in the Oval Office to discuss his work. An evangelical from a Jewish heritage, he has hosted six delegations of evangelical leaders to meet with Sunni Arab leaders. In 2006, he founded the Joshua Fund, a nonprofit dedicated to mobilizing Christians to provide humanitarian relief to Holocaust survivors and the needy in Israel to Syrian and Israeli refugees and to strengthening the church in the Middle East. Joel and his wife, Lynn, are dual U.S. Israeli citizens and live in Jerusalem, where he's joining us from today. Two of their sons have served in the Israeli Defense Forces. And with that, we'll jump right into our questions. Joel, we're so happy to have you with us today. And Firstly, I just want to ask, why did you write this book and who did you write it for? Well, thank you, Noel. It's great to be with you and the, and the NRB family. Um, look, we, I wrote Enemies and Allies because we were you know, coming up to the 20th anniversary of the horrific uh, terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, and the Middle East has changed dramatically. And uh, the enemies we had 20 years ago some of them are not our enemies today. I mean, or they may be still enemies, but they're 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 significantly degraded. And people that we nations that we would consider allies, leaders that we would consider allies today, weren't really considered allies 20 years ago. So a lot has changed. But one of the things that has happened in the last 18 to 20 months is Americans understandably have been so internally focused on COVID, closed churches, bitter partisan political fights um, uh, and, and, and all the other, you know, race riots and George Floyd and issues that really have consumed the attention of the American people and, and certainly of, of, of faith leaders, Christian leaders all over the country. I think many Americans, many evangelicals who love Israel and know that the Middle East is important have not had the bandwidth to focus on the significant level of change because there's just too much to deal with at home. And so Enemies and Allies released on September 7th. It's the first book. It's the only book that takes you inside um, the Abraham Accords, the historic game-changing peace agreements between Israel and four Arab Israeli or Arab uh, countries, uh, Arab Muslim countries that were brokered by President Trump and, and, and his team. I mean, really quite dramatic. So how did that happen? Uh, you know. Why did it happen? Why are Arab attitudes towards Israel changing so much? And who are the most serious threats to the United States, to Israel, and to our Arab, uh, moderate Arab allies today? And, and, and what's, this, what's the conditions of religious freedom in the region? You know, And so, I mean, just to give one quick example, just a few years ago, the ISIS caliphate, the, the Islamic State, was engaged in outright genocide against Christians. Praise God, that is not the case today because of the prayers of a lot of uh, Christians all over the world, but also the, you know, the military action of the United States and our allies to bring down the caliphate, a story that I tell in this book. The last part is what makes this book distinctive, Enemies and Allies, is all of that would be interesting but if you're like, well, I don't, you know, I appreciate Joel. He seems like a nice guy, but why should I care about how he sees those changes? Well, you might not. But what makes enemies and allies distinctive is I take you into the room with the King of Jordan, the president of Egypt, 
the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the president of the United States, the secretary of state, the vice president, the, the president of Israel, the, you know, you are getting to hear how they see the situation on the ground 20 years after 9-11. And that's what makes this book so interesting, I, in, my, in my view, is because God has opened up crazy doors for me to, to get to be seated, seated with the most powerful, consequential, and controversial leaders in the Middle East and get them on the record. There's literally not a single book out there that does this, and uh, it was just an honor to write. That's very interesting. Yes, and, and one of the qualities that I really liked about your book is that even if you are someone who your focus has been on really domestic issues or your focus has been on coronavirus, or maybe you don't have a lot of existing familiarity with Israel and the Arab Muslim world, you don't need a lot of preliminary knowledge to dig into enemies and allies and quickly get oriented to what's going on and, and to follow what you're explaining. And you did a wonderful job piecing together various conversations, like you said, bringing your readers in the room. Um, but you talk about something else. Obviously, Enemies and Allies is a nonfiction work. And you talk about something interesting in the book, which was that some of your fiction writings actually provided a point of connection with some of these senior dignitaries and their senior advisors. Can you tell us a little bit more about why that was? And did you expect that? Yeah, no, I did not expect that. When you write your first novel, Noel, you just pray that your mother can find it at a bookstore within a hundred miles of her house. Okay, that's sort of your objective as a novelist, as a first time novelist anyway. And you can dream about being on the New York Times bestseller list and selling 5 million copies, but you just start with, you, just, you start small. What happened over time, and I've been doing this 20 years now, is in addition to the books sort of working their way out and finding audiences all over the United States, Canada, and all over the world, uh, some more than 20 countries, it turns out um, world leaders or future leaders, emerging leaders, began to read the books. Um, Mike Pence was a congressman who started, he and Karen started reading my books and tracked me down and invited me to lunch. Who knew? <laughs> that he would become the second most powerful man on the planet. Uh, Mike Pompeo had been a con was a congressman from Kansas reading my novels and one of his staff people went to the was was the daughter of friends of ours or you know these acquaintances from the church that we were going to when we lived in Virginia and Pompeo said, "Hey, track him down. I'd love to have coffee with him someday when he's back in the country." And I, then King Abdullah <laughs> Uh, read one of my novels, and which happened to be about ISIS trying to kill him and his family and blow up his palace. And rather than banning me from the kingdom of Jordan forever, Noel, as he probably, you know, you would have expected him to do maybe, he invited my wife, Lynn, and myself to come for five days and get to know him. And that's, those are just a few examples. And I tell each of those examples in the book. In many ways, Enemies and Allies is a bit of a memoir, which makes it a little different from just a geopolitical analysis or even a spiritual religious analysis of what's going on in the Middle East. I sort of take you into the room the way I got to see it, the way I got to meet these people. And you know, there's always the risk as a Christian, you think you're putting yourself at the, at the center of the story, but, I, I, I sensed, and, and from people that I talked to, they were encouraging me to write this book. This was a way for people who, as you mentioned, who don't focus on this, who are not Middle East experts, who have a thousand other things on their plates, pastors, cr Christian journalists, producers, whatever, and lay people, to say, I know I ought to know more about the Middle East, but I don't really, it's such a fast moving story. I don't know how to get into this, the stream of the narrative. And so I take you in myself. Right, right. So in the first part of your book, you deal in a very granular way with the threats, the threats to religious liberty, the threats to regional peace. Right. And you draw attention early on to the evolving Russia, Iran, Turkey axis of power. Why is that so important? And why do you want your audience to understand? One of the things that worries me most, Noel, and turns out to worry most of the experts that I interviewed, including world leaders, regional leaders, is that Iran as a threat, the regime, is bad enough. 
right? We have an expression in Hebrew, dayenu. This alone would be enough. If you only had to deal with an Iranian regime who wanted to fund and foment terrorism, sell missiles that would be fired at Israel and our Arab allies, you know, and, you know, build nuclear weapons, you know, that would be bad enough. But Iran is building alliances with major dangerous powers. Russia it would be the leader of that, you know, already is a nuclear power. China, North Korea, but also Turkey. Uh, Turkey, which is a NATO ally, technically, but under its fairly recent last 10 years president, Recep Erdogan, Erdogan is taking Turkey from a moderate Muslim country into the dark side, into an alliance with Russia and Iran and, and the enemies of the West. That's a story that Arab leaders, Israeli leaders, intelligence chiefs in this region fear, they know, they're watching, but they don't want to say it on the record. So some of the cases, you know, some about, about this book is me listening to that and hearing their views and then beginning to write it, even though some of them just don't want to say it outright yet, but some do. And it's actually quite interesting to see um, that Iran is not a lone wolf. Iran is building out an alliance that makes them more dangerous because at some point we can imagine a scenario in which uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia decides, I'm not just going to sell Iran weapons and send them nuclear advisors and engineers. Maybe it's time to start doing actual military operations with them. They're already doing that in Syria. So what other country or countries might the Russians and the Iranians, much less others, decide to move in? This is a very serious problem and one that is easy to overlook when we're not paying attention. And, and I think you know one of the challenges for all Christian communicators is how can we be faithful watchmen on the walls, right? Ezekiel 33, other passages that talk about if you see a threat coming to a nation and you don't say anything, you're guilty. You need to say things. You need to warn people. And people like me that spend my time doing this and live in Jerusalem and crisscross the region, that allows me to do something that, the, you know, a producer, an editor, a television executive, uh, you know, a newspaper owner or a pastor won't probably have time to do. So I hope this book, Enemies and Allies, is a resource for those who need to pay attention to just how dangerous things are uh, here in the Middle East, even though some good things are happening too. Right. And that information helps, it helps Christian communicators and it helps everyone really interpret what's going on in the world, really to understand that. I found that to be such helpful context, both for your book and also for understanding um, some of the names that we're hearing more in the news and the things that are going on. So in this climate, you had the opportunity to lead six delegations of evangelical leaders to meet with various heads of Arab Muslim countries. And in those instances, you were very warmly received and had very warm, very productive conversations. How does that reflect or contrast with the situation on the ground for um, other evangelicals on the ground, for, for Christian missionaries, for evangelists, for others? Well, the Middle East and North Africa, as you know, Noel, it's been uh, a very challenging place for uh, followers of Jesus, ever since the days of Jesus, <laughs> okay? This is not new, <laughs> um, but, you know, you just ask the Apostle Peter, ask, you know, James, ask, uh, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul, what was it like? Paul, of course, himself was a religious terrorist in his day before he got dramatically saved. Where? On the road to Damascus, an Arab capital. So we know for, just from reading the Gospels and the book of Acts, it is not easy to be a follower of Jesus, to be a proclaimer of the good news um, in this part of the world. And yet things are changing, right? We, the worst situation that we've been in, in, you know, arguably a hundred years was genocide against Christians in Iraq and Syria just a few years ago. But as I said, that's over, not just because of prayer, but prayer moved the hearts of leaders, the president of the United States, as well as um, our Arab and Kurdish allies to move, to fight, to, 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 to set 
5 million people free from the ISIS reign of terror, right? With that, and with the rise of the Iranian threat, it's not just dangerous to the United States, and it's not just dangerous to Israel. It is in both cases. But the Arab leaders are increasingly realizing that Israel is not the enemy. Iran's regime is the enemy. And they're watching Biden withdraw from the region. Obviously, the surrender to the Taliban on the eve of 9-11 was just a shocking, stunning capitulation. Now, trying not to be partisan about that, but just watching it and going, we've invested 20 years in liberating Afghanistan and, 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 and sort of stabilizing it the best we could. Look, it's Afghanistan. We realize it's messy. But to just pull out is indicative of a, of a trend that the Biden administration is, is just withdrawing from the region. And so what's happening is a set of factors are, are forcing Arab leaders to fundamentally rethink how they see the world. Who are my enemies? Who are my allies? For you know, 75 plus years, we've thought of Israel, of the Zionists, the Jews. They're our enemies, the Arab leader said. Now they're like, look, if we had to go to war with Iran to neutralize the, the nuclear threat, could we count on the Biden administration to come with us? Maybe not. That's, the, that's their fear. So who could we count on? Well, Israel's the strongest military power in the region. So, so what I'm saying is there's a total fundamental reassessment. And, the, and, and with that comes, well, what is our relationship with Jews? What is our relationship with Christians? Like, maybe we have to think, rethink everything. If Saudi Arabia, for example, wants to have tourists come and investors come, they're going to have to rethink this idea of being a forbidden kingdom, closed and hostile to Jews and Christians. Who, what Jewish and Christian investors and tourists are going to come if, you, if they fear the Saudi regime? The reason I say it is because the delegations I got asked to lead, all six of them, are part of something larger that's going on. And in most of these countries, all but one, we were the first evangelical Christian leaders ever in history to be invited to meet with the kings and the crown princes, the presidents and the prime ministers. Egypt had never done this. Jo uh, Jordan had, but the United Arab Emirates hadn't. Saudi Arabia hadn't. Bahrain hadn't. And, and, and this is changing. Now, just to wrap that part up, because what you asked is really a doctoral dissertation type question. It's really a good question. The situation on the ground in lots of these countries is still challenging for the average follower of Jesus Christ, whether they're a native person to that country, a citizen, or a Christian aid worker or a missionary, what have you. It's still very challenging, and some countries more challenging than others. But the fact that the, the kings and the crown princes the presidents and the prime ministers were asking a Jewish evangelical with dual U.S. Israeli citizenship to bring evangelical leaders for the first time ever and, and sit with them, not for a 15 minute photo op, but for hours and hours and hours to talk about the most sensitive issues of hu human rights, religious freedom, peace with Israel, threats from radical Islamism. Why, are, why is extremism being taught in your mosques? Why is extremism being taught in your textbooks? Like we have to talk about all of it and often on the record. So what I'm saying is I don't wanna paint a rosy picture that life is perfect and now totally good for followers of Jesus on the ground in the Middle East and North Africa. That's not true. But is it changing for the better? Yes, and, I, and if you want, I, we can certainly go into specific examples, but, but let me stop there for now because that's a, I just needed to give you the context into which we got I got invited in to bring these delegations. Yes, and I'd love to hear a couple of examples you mentioned about in what ways is the situation for religious liberty improving for Christians in those countries? Well, let's take Egypt as an example. So the benchmark isn't all of Egyptian history. The benchmark is 2011 when the Muslim Brotherhood takes over. Okay, Mubarak falls, the Brotherhood takes over and they start a reign of terror on the entire country, but specifically against Christians, okay? The Muslim Brotherhood is the original radical Islamist terror force, which was born in Egypt in the late 1920s. So this was horrible. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood were removed from power 
by the Egyptian military and led by the commander in chief at that time, General Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. He has since been elected and re-elected president of Israel. I met him in Washington when President Trump was the first American president ever to invite him to come for a state visit. And at the end of our two hour meeting, it wasn't just me, there was 60 Middle East experts, but I had some time to talk to President LCC. And I said, I, I wanna commend you. I see that you're reaching out to Jewish leaders. I see that you're reaching out to uh, the Roman Catholic Pope is coming uh, in a few months. Uh, you, you, you're meeting with all kinds, you're meeting with Egyptian Coptic Orthodox Christians. You're rebuilding every church that was burned down damaged or destroyed during the Muslim Brotherhood reign of terror. This is pretty impressive. And I don't remember any Egyptian leader ever doing it. And Sisi said to me, well, Joel, this is the new Egypt. I am trying to, I'm trying to chart a new direction. I said, well, I'm very encouraged by this. You've rescued 100 million Egyptians, including 17 million Christians from this reign of terror of the Brotherhood. I said, now I'm just curious, maybe I missed it. Maybe it wasn't reported, but I, I haven't read any place that you have invited evangelical Christians to come and meet with you. And he said, no, I, I think that's true. I don't, I haven't. I said, well, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I just met with King Abdullah in Jordan a few months prior and King Abdullah had wanted me to begin organizing a, for a, a delegation of evangelical leaders to come. So I said, so I just wanted to plant a seed in CeCe's mind. It's something to think about. You're doing good things. More reforms are needed, but we'd like to come and talk to you. I did. I wasn't really inviting myself. I, I I didn't think of that. I just thought it's an idea. You know, this is my moment. You know, he said, Joel, would you bring a delegation like that? I'm like, mm, okay. And in about eight or nine minutes, the whole thing was established. He told his chief of staff, his uh, foreign minister, and his ambassador, go make this thing happen. Well, I flew from that meeting back to Israel, and it happened to be the time of Passover here in Israel. So I'm with my next door neighbors. We're having a big Passover Seder, and they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying that the president of Egypt has invited you to bring a delegation to talk about religious freedom and all these other issues in Cairo? You, Joel Rosenberg? I said, yeah, I know. That's, I, they said, that's crazy. I said, this is how crazy it is. Imagine a Jewish man standing before the leader of Egypt on the eve of Passover saying, let my people come. That's not how the story goes. And that led to two delegations with him. You'll read, it's all on the record and you'll read it in the book. And one last point, the second delegation I brought, Cece said, listen, I'm building the largest church building, church cathedral in the history of the Middle East. And I'm going to give it to the Egyptian Christian community on Christmas Eve. Would you come and be there as I do that? And would you bring some Christian leaders? And I said, absolutely. So just think about that. He's a devout Muslim of the world's largest Arab Muslim country, rebuilding churches and building the largest church. Look, I'm, again, I'm not saying that everything is rosy for Egyptian Christians, but we're talking tremendous progress including a law that CC signed that allows, that's allowed hundreds and hundreds of new churches to be opened and remodeled and expanded. There's real progress going on. And I document this in Enemies and Allies. That's very encouraging to hear. That's, that's really incredible. I want to dig in a little bit more to a couple of aspects of your experience leading these delegations. One of them is that as you were leading the delegations and then reporting back about the various things that had happened and in line with whatever the protocols were for each of the individual visits, you had the opportunity to engage the public on some issues that were very open to misunderstanding or of your, of your message or misinterpretation of your motives, things like that. And you talk a little bit in the book about how you handled some of that and how you, how you reasoned through it. What advice do you have for Christian communicators who are engaging the public on controversial issues and really want to maintain the integrity of their message? That's a great question. And um, I'm not sure I have an, a, a simple soundbite answer to it. Um, I, I would go back to the life of the Apostle Paul, right? In Acts chapter nine, 
we, we learn from God speaking to Ananias, who was sent to Paul to heal his blindness and, you know, and, and give him his marching orders. And Ananias hears from God, and Ananias then tells Saul, who becomes Paul, that you will that you will be God's witnesses, Christ's witnesses to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the sons of Israel, which means everybody, <laughs> okay? But kings is an interesting thing. Like Paul's, part of Paul's mission was to go reach the highest leaders at the highest levels. Most of us are not going to have that calling or those doors open to us, okay? And, you know, so that's not normally part of the average Christian experience. But sometimes those doors do open. And then the question is, how do you speak truth to power? Okay. Do you get dazzled when you walk in the room and you're just so happy to have a moment to be there and uh, that you end up not saying the things that have to get said, the reason that you're there, or that you go in sort of guns blazing. And I, of course, mean that uh, politically, uh, ideologically, whatever, not literally, because you wouldn't have a gun with you in those rooms, but and you come on so strong, you're so critical that the leader won't listen to you, that, that, that you got their one opportunity. You, you can walk out and say, I told him this, but you don't have a relationship and you and you basically shut the door that got open for you. Those, those are risks, right? And we see it in the criticisms of the evangelical leaders that did build relationships with President Trump and those that chose not to, right? I do believe that God calls different Christian leaders to different things, right? There are pastors who really, they shouldn't get involved in politics at all, except for, I think, encouraging people to register to vote, but they should stay out of it. They like just preach the gospel, make disciples. But other leaders are called to go minister to, pray for leaders. And there's always the challenge that when you get in the room, if God takes you there, that you're going to be criticized by the people on the outside. Well, you're just, you're, you know, you're just, you're just so vain, you're so ambitious, you're so full of yourself, or you're just there to curry favor or get, whatever. There's lots of ways to be critical. And even if you don't get criticized that way, there's, you know, there's always a risk that you're going to go in and not be, not be faithful. <laughs> Those are difficult things. The, uh, the Oval Office is often described as the, as the great home court advantage for any American president. And Billy Graham who's probably the, you know, the best model that we have in the modern era. He built relationships with every single president, starting with uh, Truman, but even more with Eisenhower, all the way up to President Obama. He certainly shared the gospel. He certainly, pr certainly prayed for these leaders, give, gave them counsel. But there were moments that he, you know, like with Nixon, that he did not read what was going on rightly. He did not understand how far off that, that, that Nixon was using him. Right. And so there's always that risk from us. Uh, you know, I became the first Christian leader ever to be invited to come and meet with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. In the 300 years since the Saud family has controlled the most of the Arabian Peninsula, that's what they told me. You're the you're the first leader. And now we, the group that you brought with you, you're the first Christian leaders in history. To come. Now, who is that leader? That's Mohammed bin Salman. He's been accused of being a murderer. He's been accused of being, you know, a, a torturer. He's, he's been accused of a lot of things. And I deal with that in a lot of specificity and very candidly in the book. But if you're the first Christian leader ever to be invited to meet in 300 years with the leaders of Saudi Arabia, should you not go or should you go? We've been praying for an open door. God opened the door. We did not expect the door to open weeks after Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi dissident and journalist, was brutally murdered. So I, I won't, I can't spend all the time on this. This could take the entire program, but I'll just say we went because not, not we didn't take a position. We, it was too fast. It was too early. We didn't know all the details. And even today, as I'll describe in Enemies and Allies, it, it's a jump ball. Did MBS know? Did he order it? But, but here's the key. We went because we want to talk about the fact that there aren't a, there's not a single church open in Saudi Arabia. There's 1.4 million Christian workers and their families who live in Saudi Arabia, foreign workers working in the oil fields, the you know the hotels, the service sector, whatever. 
Not a single church open. Okay. Who's going to go advocate for that? Paul wanted to go see Nero, right? So you'd say, well, Nero, he was horrible. Okay. Pilate was horrible. Festus was horrible. All the leaders that Paul met with, horrible. So this is challenging, but I will say this. I asked the crown prince when we were there, I said, I appreciate you inviting us as evangelicals. I'm guessing the term evangelical Christian isn't a term used much here in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Is that a fair and that assessment? And he laughed. He said, yes, that's probably fair. I said, well, we have a pastor in our delegation, an ordained pastor. Could he just take a moment and explain what is an evangelical Christian and what is it that we believe? Okay. That conversation is in the book. It was on the record. I don't apologize for saying yes to the invitation. I understand the criticism. You shouldn't have done it. But I think talking about these issues, plus talking about Jesus, plus asking the crown prince, how can we pray for you since we're commanded to, and then closing the meeting in prayer in the name of Jesus, I think that was the right thing to do. But these are not easy. These are not easy decisions yeah. to make. Yeah, no, this is, it's a very interesting question of how as a Christian do you engage those opportunities when they come versus not giving cover or credence to malign behavior. And I did find that to be one of the most interesting aspects of your book. Um, one of the other things that was going on during that time uh, were the Abraham Accords, the peace and normalization agreements between Israel and several Arab Muslim countries. What is your outlook for the next chapter of the Abraham Accords and potential future normalization agreements in the short term and in the long term? Well, Noel, uh, one of the things that's interesting about enemies and allies is that I tell the story of sitting with the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed, known as MBZ, and saying to him, listen, we, we millions of Christians are praying for the peace of Jerusalem. But we haven't seen a peace treaty between an Arab leader and Israel in a quarter of a century. We're looking who we're looking who's going to be the next Arab leader to do it. We just wanted to say that to him because, you know, we were in the room to our meeting in the palace in Abu Dhabi. And he leaned forward and he said, Joel, it's going to be me. I'm ready. We're like, what? Fascinating conversation. Two years before MBZ was the first leader to make peace with Israel to lead the Abraham Accords, but we, but we walked out of that palace under the restriction that that meeting had been off the record at that time. So we couldn't come out with this big headline and say, we know an, a new Arab country is gonna make peace for the first time in a generation. So we kept our word, we kept praying, we kept close contact, and then it happened. And I tell that story. I think that the Saudis are definitely trying to weigh now should they join the Abraham Accords, right? When we met with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia twice for multiple hours and, and, and just, yeah, and then with his inner circle, the Abraham Accords hadn't happened yet. And my conversations, our conversations with him, MBS, on that topic of making peace with Israel, that remains off the record. But now four Arab countries have made peace with Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, and another Muslim country, Kosovo, made uh, peace or normalized relations with Israel as well through the work of President Trump, Vice President Pence, Secretary Pompeo, Jared Kushner, and the others. That's big. And so Saudi leaders and the Saudi people are, are watching that and thinking, is it in our national interest to join them? That's, uh, that's what we should be praying for. That would be the mother of all peace deals um, if the Saudis decide to do it. I wrote a novel about this, by the way, a few years ago called The Jerusalem Assassin about a crown prince in Saudi Arabia who decides to make peace with Israel and all the bad guys come out of the woodwork to try to blow it up and knock him off course. We'll see, uh, Noel, but I think other Arab countries are gonna join. Will Saudi Arabia be one of them? Um, stay tuned. But I, I think we should keep praying for this. That's a fascinating connection between your earlier work and what is currently going on. And you highlight yes. many of those interesting connections in Enemies and Allies. And I want to talk about another project of yours. Um, why did you launch allisrael.com and allarab.news? 
Yeah, all Israel news and all Arab news, and you're giving the, the, the precise uh, uh, website uh, addresses. We launched it because as every NRB member knows, the, the bias against Christians is off the charts in the media. I mean, it's, it just, it's just horrifying. And it's hard to know whom to trust on any topic from critical race theory to abortion, to the economy, to education or anything else. But that's certainly true about what's going on in Israel and the Arab world and Iran and Russia. And so we decided to launch these two websites on September 1st, 2020 to provide original coverage and exclusive interviews and uh, unique analysis of what's happening in Israel and the Arab Muslim world and what it means and why it matters, particularly to Christians. We are focused primarily on an evangelical audience worldwide, uh, but we also have many Jewish and Muslim and non-religious and other religious uh, readers. Not every story has a Bible verse, not every story has a, an evangelical angle, but that's the worldview that we look through. And we are trying to be a service in real time, we've got Israelis and Palestinians who are, you know, a great team that God has given us. And in many ways, I would like us to not only provide this uh, day to day, hour to hour, but to become a news wire service for NRB affiliates who are thinking we can't afford to open a bureau, you know, in Jerusalem. It's expensive. There's COVID. Uh, we don't have the expertise, but our people want to know what's happening in Israel and the Arab world. And by the way, we started all Arab news at the same time, rather than having it as one, because we knew there would be Arab uh, sources and Muslim leaders, Christian leaders, others who just would not be comfortable yet being quoted by, you know, uh, profiled by, written about on all Israel news. So it's two. We think of it as two sections of the newspaper. They're cross-linked. But I want to encourage not only your all your People can sign up for our, our free newsletters. There's an all Israel one, all Arab one. So you'll get the headlines right to you. That's the best way to do it. And that's free. But then also, if you're, in, if you're involved in a news agency, a news media organization yourself, consider posting our direct links. We'd love to be in touch with you on it, but there's no, there's no you don't have a, need to have a contract with us. We haven't decided to charge for it. But let us be your trusted resource because your readers and your viewers and listeners want to know what's happening and they want to know whom to trust. And, and people can also look at our advisory board and our, and our board to see who is helping us. And so you can assess whether we are trustworthy or not. But I'm very grateful to Troy and to the NRB family who had me speak at the Honoring Israel Breakfast at the convention in Dallas in June, and and then interviewing Secretary Pompeo um, at the uh, you know in the main one of the main sessions, and this was entirely because this is what we're doing. We're trying to resource the Christian media world that is just disgusted by and rightly so the type of horrific uh, bias against Israel and against Christians and everything else in the region. That's right. Well, those are very valuable resources. And thank you so much for making that connection um, to our NRB audience specifically. One thing we know about our NRB audience is that they're very action oriented. And I did say earlier, one of the great things about Enemies and Allies, your newest book, is that you don't need a lot of preliminary knowledge of the region to jump right into the story and follow what's going on and, and, and get, get full value from it. But there may be readers who, and members of our audience who haven't read the book yet, who do want more knowledge and want to read more and learn more about religious liberty and other regional issues in Israel and the Arab Muslim world, what resources would you recommend to them? Yeah, well, um, uh, we have a, a, a book club on all Israel news. So we have lists and links to books that we have already reviewed and believe these are really useful. We won't agree with every single thing in every book, but this is the type of books that we say, because we're getting asked that question all the time. What do, what do you read? What do you trust? And that's the hard thing to do. Um, and, I, and you'll see in Enemies and Allies, you'll also see um, you, you know, references to books that I find helpful and to other resources. Um, and I would encourage people not only to read it, but you know, if, 
if you you know buy one for your pastor, buy one for the the head of your company or your 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 supervisor. Um, but also, my wife and I turned over the rights to Enemies and Allies to the nonprofit, the American nonprofit that runs all Israel News and all Arab News. So we're not making any money on this. It's all going to help build out this new media organization. And so one of the benefits of that is you can do a deal with Tyndale House Publishers, who published the book, to get a special rate if you want to buy you know, 50 or 100 for your staff or, or use it as a fundraiser, you know, as a premium for donors to your ministry if you find it is helpful. So those are some of the ways that you can, uh, um, you can do it. And then we have a podcast called Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. It's a joint project of All Israel News, but also the Joshua Fund, our nonprofit that has invested more than $80 million over the last 15 years to strengthen the church in the Middle East and care for the poor and the needy. You referenced it earlier. And so uh, the, the executive director of the Joshua Fund and I do a, a weekly podcast called Inside the Epicenter. And there's new ones. There are new podcasts coming very shortly on All Israel News, too, because we're finding lots of interest and we're trying to meet that need. Excellent. And um, I do actually have a copy of the book. I'm just showing it right here. This is hey, that's fine. <laughs> that is the book. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So we do recommend that. And um, Joel, thank you so much. This has been such an informative and engaging session. And I think it's provided great value to our audience today. Can you just let our audience know where else they can follow your work, Twitter handles, website, whatever else? Sure. Uh, my personal website is joelrosenberg.com. And yes, you can follow me on Twitter at Joel C. Rosenberg. And we also have a, a public Facebook page, which is Joel Rosenberg's Epicenter Team. Uh, so we have about 65,000 or so people following that page. So there's a number of different ways. And of course, allisrael.com and allarab.news. So, and the Joshua Fund, joshuafund.com. So we're trying to provide a sort of a full service on the educational side, the news and information side, but also, okay, that's all fascinating, Joel. How do I help strengthen Christians in the Middle East, whether they're Jewish believers or Muslim background believers? How, how can I make a difference? That's what the Joshua Fund is. We're essentially a, a, a mutual fund you're like, I want to help, but I wouldn't know the first thing, right? How do I invest $50 a month? Where would that go? How would I know? That's what the Joshua Fund does. And uh, we want to be your resource um, for everything related to the Middle East um, and, and a trusted resource at that. That's excellent. Thank you so much for making our audience aware of those resources. It's been such an honor having you with us today. And this has been such a wonderful conversation. And I want to thank you, Joel. And I also want to thank our audience for joining us, for signing up for these webinars and for staying with us um, to hear what our guests have to share. Um, we hope that this has provided value to you. We hope that you've learned a lot and um, gotten some suggestions for resources that will be helpful to you. We thank you so much for being with us and we look forward to having you again next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.